Before the video begins, make sure you've subscribed to see more natural history content like this. Hit the bell icon to keep yourself in the loop and leave a comment if you feel like it. Brand new designs are up on the Edge Redbubble. Werewolves, spiders, FedEx amphibians, protocrocs, and more. Go check out the Redbubble with links in the description and comment section below. Dinosaurs. The word brings to mind frightful and terrifying animals, dragons of reality. Some of the largest animals to ever walk the earth, big enough to dwarf buildings and swallow humans whole. The very nature of their existence fascinates our imagination and fuels our quest for knowledge. But ever wondered what it takes to make one? In evolutionary terms, everything is related. So much so that technically dinosaurs and birds are reptiles and mammals are fish. But these relations are so distant and ancient, they become more confusing than helpful. Dinosaurs are an extensive group of animals that were the mainland animals for 164 million years, during an era of time known as the Mesozoic. In order to understand what a dinosaur is, we need to understand a little bit of the basics of a field of science called phylogenetics. Phylogenetics just being the way in which we try to understand the evolutionary relationships among living things. Taxonomy is a similar thing, but is older and generally now used only for bookkeeping. Phylogenetics, on the other hand, uses a bunch of methods to get answers, like DNA sequences, protein amino acid sequences, and morphology. So, by the basic phylogenetic explanation, dinosaurs are defined as a group of the most recent common ancestors of Triceratops and modern birds, or the group Neornithes and all their descendants. Some researchers have suggested using Megalosaurus and Iguanodon as the example critters since they were the first dinosaurs cited by the scientist who first coined the term Dinosauria, all the way back in 1841. Either definition results in the same groups of animals being termed dinosaurs. The Dinosauria is the clay to which dinosaurs belong, at step 1. The Dinosauria is nestled somewhere inside the much larger clade Archosauria which also happens to include pterosaurs, the flying reptiles, crocodilians, and all the weird offshoots that look croc-like but really, really aren't. The Dinosauria includes a handful of big beefy groups of animals you may be familiar with. There's the theropods, the usually two-legged, usually carnivorous critters with usually big heads, little arms, and big claws. Then you got the sauropods, the long necks, which kept their ponderous weights lifted off the ground with four columnar limbs and counterbalanced with their usually enormous necks with equally enormous tails. Next on the list are the ornithopods, the duckbills, though none had truly duck-shaped bills and many were quite unique, but I digress. These guys had large back legs, small arms, big wide heads, and mouths stuffed with batteries of chewing teeth. The Marginocephalians were a huge group that started out small, running around on their back legs, but eventually split into the dome-headed, boulder-gut pachycephalosaurs and the enormously rotund, big beefy hornheads, the Ceratopsians. Finally are the armor hides, the Thyreophorans. This group is further split up into the group that went way too hard into the impenetrable fortress department, the club-tailed, wide-gauged hipped ankylosaurs while the other group used a tail of spikes and a set of bony billboards for display. They were the stegosaurs. The exact arrangement of these groups within the Dinosauria has been a topsy-turvy mess over the last decade, and I'll get into why here in a bit, but first I think I should bring up the precise characteristics that make something a dinosaur. What if you found some bones just eroding out in the open all willy-nilly? How do you know if it is a dinosaur? Well, first off, dinosaurs are some of the few reptiles with the distinction of having their limbs tucked directly underneath their bodies. Most reptiles have some configuration of their limbs outwards and at an angle. Dinosaurs have what is called erect limbs. The ball joints of the femur point directly sideways at a near 90 degree angle into the hip socket, so the legs can help support a lot more weight. 
Reptiles like lizards have what is called sprawling limbs. Then you have crocodilians that have a posture in between the two. If we take a look at the top of the skull of a dinosaur, we'll find the next thing that makes them dinosaurs. See these two holes? They are called supratemporal fenestrae. They are two huge holes that allow muscles to attach the jaws to the top of the skull, plus a bunch of other things we don't need to worry about. The feature that makes a dinosaur a dinosaur here is the little shelf of bone within the hole, which is called the fossa. The shape and placement of this shelf is what sets dinosaurs apart in this department. Prepare for another vocab word. Next up on the list is the epipophyses. The epipophyses in dinosaurs are unique in being these cute little prongs on the back of the tops of the neck vertebrae, but only the ones that are after the first two which happen to be called the axis and atlas. Next is the deltopectoral crest. That mouthful refers to this chunk of thin bone here on the humerus. In dinosaurs, it's at or more than 30% down the length of the humerus and is where the deltopectoral muscles attach. Pretty helpful for having grabby hands. They also have a radius, this bone here, shorter than 80% the length of the humerus. If we take a quick peek inside a dino crotch, we'll get to our next characteristic. Since dinosaurs have big meaty tails that help them move, they need parts of their bones that attach muscles between their tail, hips, and thighs. The biggest of these muscles is called the caudal femoralis, and you can get an idea of where it attaches just in its name. Caudo refers to the tail, and femoralis is the femur. So, the characteristic next on our list is called the fourth trochanter and is a triangular knob of bone pointing backwards from the inside and back of the thigh bone. That triangle is the thing that attaches to all those beefy tail muscles. In dinosaurs, the fourth trochanter is also asymmetrical with one edge of the triangle forming a steeper angle than the other. Dinosaurs have weird feet, it's just the way it is. You know how we have a heel and walk on feet that are flat? That's a condition called plantigrade. Not many animals do it that way. Others that do are bears. The other way of walking is called digitigrade. This is the condition in which the animal walks on the balls of their toes. These critters usually have really messed up ankle bones in our view. In between the foot and toe bones and the lower leg bone are the ankle bones. Specifically, this piece the astragalus, and this piece, the calcaneum. I won't bother with specific differences between different animal groups right now, but stay with me. In some animals that walk on their toes, the calcaneum sticks out backwards. But in dinosaurs, both the astragalus and calcaneum are squished into teeny bones between the toes and lower leg to help in movement. The part of their ankle bones that sets them apart is the width of the fibula, this leg bone, in comparison to the width of the articulating surface of the ankle bones. The fibula's surface takes up 30% or less. If we swing a dino skull around to the backside, we can take a gander at the next feature. These two bones are called the exocipitals. They combine with another pair of bones, the opisthotic, and some other bits to create the occiput, which is the passageway that the spinal cord uses to connect to the brain. Super important bits right there. In dinosaurs, the exocipitals don't touch each other in the middle of the skull, on the bottom of the inner space of the brain cavity. Apparently, that happens in some other critters. Dinosaurs have a weird pelvis too. The exact orientation of the bones in their dummy thick hips is a useful tool to tell the major groups of dinosaurs apart, but we'll get to that here in a bit. Their hip bones are made of three chunks the ischium, this sharper backward pointing piece here, the ilium, the broad bowl-shaped piece up here, and the pubis, the forward or backward pointing flared or pointy piece here. What makes the dino pelvis unique is that the ischium has two connection points which make concave depressions in the bone. One connects the ischium to the ilium and the other connects it to the pubis. If we take a look at the dinosaur's tibia, the big bone in the lower leg, will come to the next thing. There's an elevated piece of bone at the top of this bone. It's called the nemeal crest. 
In dinosaurs, it curves to the front and outer side. If we turn this juicy bone around and turn our attention to the lower part of the tibia, we'll see a little ridge of bone. In dinosaurs, it is oriented from the center to the outside. The calcaneum, the other ankle bone, has a hollow profile on the concave surface that articulates with the fibula. That's the basic list. Some differ depending on the group we're talking about, but if you have a sizable number of these characteristics in your fossil, you've probably got a dinosaur on your hands. I mean, chances are high you could just look at the hips if you got hip bones and figure it out from there. Now, we move on to the major differences among the dinosaurs. There are currently a bunch of groups of dinosaurs. I went over them earlier. Theropods, sauropods, marginocephalians, ornithopods, and thyreophorns. They can be lumped into one of two giant groups. One group is the saurischia, which translates to lizard-hipped, and the other group is the ornithischia, translating to bird-hipped. The hip part of those names indicates what sets them apart. The lizard-hipped dinosaurs, the saurischia, have an X-shaped pelvis, with the pubis bone jutting forward and the ischium pointing backwards. They're called lizard hit because lizards or reptiles in general have a similarly shaped pelvis, uh, but of course these are convergently evolved shapes rather than any indication of true evolutionary relationships. The bird-hipped dinosaurs, the ornithischia, have a pubis that has a forward jutting spur, but most of its length is jacked backwards to lie near the backward pointing ischium bone. This is the same general orientation seen in birds, hence their name. The situation here is even weirder though. Birds are directly descended from theropod dinosaurs, making them avian theropod dinosaurs of course. But the non-avian theropods are saurischian dinosaurs, with lizard hips, not bird hips. Birds evolved their bird-like hips independently of the true bird-hipped dinosaurs. Evolution is just weird like that. Of course, all these checkboxes for what makes a dinosaur a dinosaur becomes super blurry and all shades of grey when it comes to the earliest dinosaurs. They all start looking the same and get really hard to tell apart from all the other weird archosaurs that lived with them back in the Triassic. Also of note is that both Saurischia and Ornithischia are pretty solidly defined groups that don't see a lot of change, but where they place and exactly the orientation of evolutionary relationships between the groups within them have, and that's where some minor controversy lies. You see, traditionally Dinosauria looks like this. It's divided into the Saurischia and Ornithischia. Saurischia contains the two-legged theropods and the long-necked sauropods, specifically named sauropodomorphs. Ornithischia, on the other hand, has the ornithopods, marginocephalians, and thyreophorans. This is how it is taught in most intro paleontology classes, and this is how it's been for quite a while. It's most likely the correct overall orientation, minus some fidgeting with groups near the base of the dinosaur family tree. Then, in 2017, came a new orientation of the family tree, proposed by Matthew G. Barron, David Norman, and Paul Barrett. In their paper, they provide a new analysis that places the theropods and the ornithischians in a new group, called Ornithoscalida, and sauropodomorphs plus the Herrerasauria group together in the Saurischia group. They found that the traditional Saurischia of two-leggers and long necks didn't hold up anymore, and that theropods shared a more recent common ancestor with the beaked, bird-hipped dinosaurs. Ornithoscalida is not a new name, just FYI. It was first proposed by Darwin's most obnoxious supporter, Thomas Henry Huxley, all the way back in 1870. The researchers provided some good data and evidence to prove their claims, but since the publication of their findings, many other researchers have provided some really good clapbacks, most of which find no real useful difference between the traditional and this newer hypothesis. Most researchers stick to the traditional classification, though it does remain possible that the new one holds some weight. That, in a big lengthy nutshell, is a dinosaur. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching.
Special thanks goes to my Elephant Tier patrons, Thea Svensson, Staniforth Hopkins, Dinosaur, Chris Frampton, Biotaverse, Arda Bayer, and Christoph Hubbinger, as well as my Tyrannosaur patrons, Iron Bladesman, Henry Brennan, Danny Van Heck, and Dana Manchester. Thank you.